Hey everyone, Cody Hayes here, and I'd like to welcome you to part four as we look at the second portion of Judaism. And where we left off was with the Persians and their religion at the time, which was Zoroastrianism, and the influence that the ideas that the Persians have would have on Judaism. Of course, the Persians were the individuals that liberated the Jewish people from the Babylonians. But moving on, now uh, we have some encounters that the Jewish people have with the Greeks and the Romans. Well, Israel, which of course would include Judea, would eventually find itself under Greek control during the reign of Alexander the Great, and this Greek control would last until the year 163 BCE. The top image that's on the screen is of Alexander of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, and his teacher, Aristotle. And Alexander is essentially conquering the known world, and he conquers Israel, Judea, and this Greek control would last until 163 BC. Of course, when Alexander dies at the age of 33, his empire is divided up among his generals, and Israel becomes a part of what was known as the Seleucid Empire. But the relationship between, you know, the Jewish people and the Greeks, uh, you know, who controlled them now, was in many respects a parasitic relationship. So, you know, parasitic relationships, it's not in the interest of the parasite to kill the host. So, you know, what you would want to do is essentially, you know, kind of let the people that you control, you know, live their lives and, of course, you know, take their tax money and whatnot, but let them pretty much live their lives. Well, that's not what the Greeks did. Uh, they thought that it would be a great idea to put an image of their main god, Zeus, in the temple in Jerusalem. And this, of course, made the Jewish people go ballistic and led by Jude, excuse me, Judas Maccabean, uh, the Greeks, or not the Greeks, the Jews, eventually, you know, kick out the Greeks and, you know, re-cleanse the temple. And this particular event is celebrated with the feast known as Hanukkah. Well, during this period of Greek rule, the Jewish people would begin to disperse around the Greco-Roman world. So essentially, you know, you had Jewish people who, you know, were living in areas outside of their homeland. This is what's called the Jewish diaspora, where you have Jewish people uh, living in places like Corinth, Galatia, Athens, Alexandria, Carthage, Rome. Well, during this Jewish diaspora, Jews who lived in Greek-speaking areas would translate their scriptures into Greek from Hebrew, and additional books would be written during this time period as well, and this led to the creation of what is known as the Septuagint, Septuagint being a word here for 70, and it's often abbreviated by the Roman numerals for 70. So here's what you had going on. Uh, you had Jewish people living throughout the Greco-Roman world, many of them no longer even speaking Hebrew. So 
basically a, a group of rabbis, and the tradition is that it was 70 rabbis, uh, gathered in Alexandria. This would have been about two centuries before the birth of Jesus. And essentially they took the works of the Hebrew Bible, which were originally written in Hebrew, and they translated them into Greek. And also, you know, from this time period, you would have additional books as well, which, you know, led to the creation of what's called the Septuagint, because supposedly 70 rabbis produced it. But, you know, some of the other works that would become part of it would be, you know, the Maccabean books, which tell the Hanukkah story, uh, the book of Baruch, which is attributed to Jeremiah's scribe, uh, the Book of Wisdom, that kind of thing. Well then, moving forward, around the year 63 BCE, the Roman Empire took control of Judea, of Israel, under the leadership of Pompey the Great. The bottom image uh, depicts this particular scene. Um, Pompey was one of the two major generals of the Roman Empire, the other one being Julius Caesar. So he essentially, you know, goes into Jerusalem, conquers the city, you know, conquers, you know, the nation there, but he hears about, you know, this kind of sacred area within the temple in Jerusalem and he decides he's going to go into this area and of course this sacred area is the Holy of Holies where only the high priest was allowed to go in. So Pompey essentially, you know, enters the temple and, you know, there's members of the temple staff trying to stop him from going into the Holy of Holies, and basically he pushes them out of the way. He enters into the Holy of Holies. He looks around, and then he says, well, where is the God? Because, of course, he was thinking that there would be an image of the Abrahamic God, and that's not something that the Jewish people do. I mean, Judaism does have religious art. The whole, you know, notion of condemning images wasn't meant to forbid, you know, art, because you can see within Judaism, you know, images of angels and cherubims, images of the patriarchs and of Moses, but what you won't see is an image of God. That's something you won't see within Judaism. You do see it within Christianity, and there's different theological understandings for why. But, you know, regardless of which, that's what Pompey was expecting to see, and of course, that's not what he saw. And it might be important to add here, and this was something that uh, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, talked about, and in fact, there was a stone found during archaeological digs around uh, the ruins of the temple in Jerusalem, and I believe that this was written um, in Latin, I think think but basically it was a stone warning of foreigners in this case non-jewish people that if they were to enter a particular portion of the temple they had no one to blame but themselves for their own death so well the jewish people attempt to revolt against the roman empire so, 67 CE, the Jewish people, they attempt to revolt against the Roman Empire. Of course, might as well mention that, um, you know, the Roman occupation, this is the world in which Jesus grew up in. 
but the Jewish people essentially were tired of the corrupt Roman politicians. And so they attempted to revolt against Rome in an event that is known as the Roman Jewish War. And I remember one of the first times I taught this class, I had a student say to me, somehow I don't think this attempt was successful. And the image on the screen would of course give the answer of no to that as the image on the screen showing the um, Ark of Titus, the Arch of Titus, and basically the taking away of the spoils of the temple, one of them being the temple menorah there. Uh, the attempt was unsuccessful, and the second temple was destroyed in 70 CE, traditionally on the same date that it was destroyed nearly 500 years prior. And that date, if memory serves me correct, is August the 24th, the date of the destruction of the Second Temple. And the, all that's left of the Second Temple is what's known as the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. That's all that's left of it. Um, but kind of mentioning, you know, of the spoils uh, taken from uh, the Temple. Of course, the big one, you know, shown on the screen here is of the Temple Menorah. I'm not sure if this involved John Paul II or Benedict XVI, but, you know, whichever Bishop of Rome, whom we commonly refer to as the Pope, went to the Holy Land, a number of Jewish people were yelling at the Pope give us back the menorah that supposedly the Vatican has it and the argument that's given here is that you know when the Roman Emperor Constantine whom we'll look at when we get into Christianity you know when he favors the Christian movement you know he gave uh, the Christian community in this case its dominant bishop in Rome whom we commonly refer to as the Pope the menorah of the temple in Jerusalem. But considering that, you know, this particular event took place in 70 CE, and, you know, Constantine favoring, you know, this movement, which at the time was, you know, a very small movement, though it had started to make some significance, but it's a pretty small movement. Um, you know, no one could have foreseen that you know, 260 uh, years later that it would become the movement favored by the Roman Empire and then, you know, almost 300 years later it would become the official religion of the Roman Empire. No one could have foreseen that. So what probably really happened to the Temple Menorah? Well, it's probably very similar to what probably happened to the Ark of the Covenant, that any of, you know, the precious metals that were on it were taken and melted down. So more than likely the Ark of the Temple, excuse me, the menorah of the Temple, um, more than likely no longer exists. Well, we need to stop here, and then when we come back, we will continue on with, of course, the um, second portion of Judaism, where we'll be looking at, you know, the basically identity of the Jewish people after the temple. So, take care, I will symbolically see you then. <laughs>